Today we're doing something slightly different, because the Ultimate Nerd Award Show just happened. Following somewhere close to the technical portion of the Oscars that doesn't make it to TV, we recently saw... Yale University's William Nordhaus and New York University's Paul Romer won this year's Nobel Economics Prize for integrating climate change and technological in innovation into macroeconomic analysis. Wow, even with that inspirational music playing in the background, it's really hard to hear integrating climate change innovation into macroeconomic analysis and think, I've got to hear more. But that's what this channel is here for. I mean, this is a Nobel Prize winning idea, so it has to be more than climate change innovation is good. For those of you who really want to get into it, I'd link to the award winning 50 page paper in the description. But for the rest of us who don't have a strong need to know exactly what this means, which, oh man, when the letters outnumber the numbers, I'm out. So let's dig in and see what we learned. The Nobel Committee said Nordhaus was the first person to create an integrated assessment model that describes the interaction between the economy and the climate. Which, really? Nobody did that before 2018? Creating that equation would be more of a shoe in for an award than a period piece starring Meryl Streep. What did the equation find? Is climate change innovation good for the economy? <laughs> Gee, I'll give you one guess. More core to the goals of this paper is... My own view is that there basically is no alternative to a market solution. And the reason is that if you look around, who are we talking about that's going to solve the problem? It's you and me. There are billions of individuals, millions of firms, thousands of governments, hundreds of nations. And for them to take action, they're going to have to have incentives. Spoken like a true economist. So the goal is to not die in a climate change to Mad Max hellscape, and the means of achieving that goal are through incentives. Because well, you gotta sweeten the deal a little more than just offering survival as a species. Before we go on, we need to split these two scientists, because they actually didn't work together at any point. They just published similar papers on similar topics. The man from the clip we just played was Yale University's William Nordhaus who chose to focus on the negative side effects, and thus restrictions, on endeavors to bring about future prosperity. Well, he sounds just delightful at parties. Hey, do you want to see my complex economic model estimating future doom and gloom for our planet? In joyous celebration, upon learning he had won this prize, he noted that he hadn't yet convinced the government of his own country. Yeah, his acceptance speech really read like a suicide note. Romer, on the other hand, was a breath of fresh air. Romer has emphasized how the economy can expand the boundaries and thus the technological possibilities of fighting climate change, saying we can absolutely make substantial progress towards protecting the environment without giving up the chance to sustain growth. Wow, these two are quite the odd couple. I think we found our climate change good cop, bad cop. First, let's check out Nordhaus whose research led to this conclusion. For Nordhaus, the best solution is to establish a tax of 40 euros per ton of carbon that is emitted. We are underpricing our natural resources. We are giving away, so to speak, carbon emissions for free. And we need to make sure that people pay the price, that's to say the cost of these damages that this imposes on society in the future. Imposing strong taxes on items to change people's behavior. That'll never be popular. We should be clear, a tariff is a tax. It's a tax on American imports, and it looks like we're going to be getting more of that. And on that you know, note, John, Walmart issued a warning. The retail giant yesterday said it may be hiking prices on certain products with this trade spat with China. The world is weird, guys. I don't know. The solution here is a 40 euro per ton carbon tax, or let me rephrase that, a global tariff on foreign chemical exports into the atmosphere. 40 euros though, trying to be classy and go with the European currency? We all know you're from America. More importantly though, how did you get to such a specific number? Well, let's go into the research. The first thing you have to accept to understand this logic is there's a very real and measurable future cost to burning coal. And I'm not talking about morality or ecology, we're more focused on the other green. Dollar dollar bills. It concludes that if we don't act, 
the overall costs and risks of climate change will be equivalent to losing at least five and as much as 20% of GDP or more. So a 5 to 20% drop in GDP per year for emitting carbon dioxide specifically generated from using CO2 emitting resources. Sounds like something we would probably want to avoid. Basically his goal is to use his models and economic insights to illuminate such considerations as the role of discounting future climate changes, the risk of catastrophic damages, and the role of technological change in the energy system. So what is any of that mean? Discounting future damages. He's not saying half off all future climate change disasters with the purchase of up to four hurricane aid packages today. Instead, the basic idea is figuring out what the present value of future GDP reductions are. Alright, that may sound confusing, but let me put it this way. If you knew that in 20 years, you were going to lose $10,000. I know, I'm starting to sound as sad as this guy, but stay with me. Would you pay $20,000 today? If you're smart, no. Because if your options are to lose it today and lose it in 20 years, lose it down the line and invest it now. Would you pay $1 to avoid that loss in the future? Probably. Because if you found a way to make $1 worth $10,000 in 20 years, chances are you'd be in jail long before that 20 years is up. Either that or taking out one of those annoying YouTube ads I always see. Here in my garage, just bought this uh, new Lamborghini here. Skip ad, skip ad, where, where are you? The goal is to find that sweet spot where the amount you spend now will be about equal to the cost you will incur down the road. And that's what Nordhaus tried to do in his award winning research. The tax on carbon dioxide producing materials is meant to price in the real cost we will have to pay as a society as a result of using polluting fuels. Now, most of you are probably scratching your heads and feeling like I do when I look at this $1,300,000 painting. Well, I could have done that. The real value he adds to the conversation are the series of high level models that he created to map out thousands of constantly changing variables to estimate the cost for years to come. Unfortunately, breaking down how thousands of variables impact each other might be more complicated and time consuming than just creating my own model. So not a roamer, the happy and hopeful NYU professor. What happens with technology is under our control. If we collectively set our minds to improving technology of a particular type, we can do that. All right, so that might seem weird. I mean, at first glance, rewarding an economist for researching green tech economics might feel like calling the police and having a protester show up. Now, I'm sure you know a lot about the issue at hand, but I'd rather someone specifically trained in the problem we're dealing with. So what does Romer add to the conversation? Well, I could throw out a ton of words that'll have half of you thinking I'm speaking in tongues, but we really have to understand the solo growth model. Basically, the solo growth model, which won a Nobel Peace Prize in 1987, tried to figure out how economies grew. Wow, pretty late to the game and trying to answer that one. A simplified version of it had three factors, labor, machines, and ideas. Too many machines and you get things like Yeah, it's just too much and leads to inefficiencies. Too many workers and I'm pretty sure I don't have to lay out what the problem is there. What Solo did was find that there was a point where you have the right amount of workers and the right amount of machinery and ah, you've achieved optimization. Which is basically nirvana for economists. So where do you go from there? Well, that's when the idea and efficiency factors kick in. The problem? Salu just assumed that ideas were going to be public and out of the control of any one body. You know, people think of things and then they just kind of get done. Because the idea of patents weren't around in the exotic year of... 1987? Yeah, that's clearly going to be a bit of a problem. Now this is where Paul Romer kicked down the door in 1990 with his paper Endogenous Technical Change which solidified its contributions to the no-duh economic science by declaring boldly in the first sentence, growth in this model is driven by technological change that arises from intentional investment decisions made by profit-maximizing agents. 
The paper was a game changer and really changed the idea led to less of some guy just kind of thinking of, you know what would be cool, and then going out and doing it, and more of a means to an end from corporate people and investors. Of course, the part that made it something that, again, you couldn't have created in middle school was the proving of these concepts and the equations to optimize and figure out all the numbers. This informed a lot of Romer's future research, including what got him this Nobel Prize. He showed how to incorporate technological progress into otherwise standard economic models. Before his work, the idea was that growth was sustained by technological progress, but technological progress was external to the economic environment, was exogenous. Paul Romer showed how to generate endogenous technological progress that is self-sustaining in models of growth. Alright, so Romer's contribution is more that his idea can allow growth models to include incentives for creative thinking by proving and being able to measure economic growth that can be encouraged by strong patent systems and investment in research and development. So where do we go from here? Well, new academic work is beginning to combine Romer's and Nordhaus's models by studying how investment in research and development can lead to new technologies that will replace fossil fuels. With these combined models, we should actually be able to pretty accurately measure the impact of thousands of different interacting variables like carbon taxation, investment in R&D, patent strength, and all of that on future climate change damages, which will allow people to present more precise numbers and statistics for world leaders to ignore. Anyways, congratulations on winning the Nobel Peace Prize and furthering our understanding of how climate change interacts with all of these different variables. Thank you and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you want to support independent nonpartisan comedy news, remember to subscribe by clicking on this floating logo to the right of my head. Or do it the old fashioned way by clicking the subscribe button below. Ring that bell so that freedom will continue to ring, and remember to give me a thumbs up. Lastly, as always, thank you for watching.